Flores, as Mark mentioned, is a, a postdoc in his group, and she earned her PhD at the University of Munich, and she'll be speaking to us about custom single-stranded DNA. Over to you, Flores. It's a great pleasure to be here and share our science and vision with you today. Um, Mark has already talked about potential therapeutic applications of DNA origami, and um, I will be focusing on why this hasn't happened so far, and also talk about what is needed from a production standpoint of view in um, producing this DNA origami particles. One. So one of the main challenges in DNA origami production is the availability of long single-stranded DNA. And why this is needed can be nicely seen in this animation that will show you how one could imagine that such a DNA origami self-assembles in solution. What you see here is an illustration of this um, long, one long single strand in blue that is folded upon binding to several short oligonucleotides into a desired shape. And I think what you see like from the beginning on here is that when you say that one, the blue part is all one long single strand, this makes up 50% of your DNA origami. But also its length and its sequence will define the overall shape and size that you will later have. And until recently, there were simply no production methods with therapeutic suitability. Because such a process would need to meet three main requirements. First, scalability, of course. Um, if you want to go into animal studies, you will start not only with micrograms in small animals, but then easily go to milligrams or gram scale when you want to test your therapeutic application in larger animals. Second, you need to have really pure DNA. You want to have single base accuracy and you want to have low endotoxin levels in a biotechnological process and simply no off-target DNA in your solution. And the third is that of course, you want to have a sy synthetic sequence. That means you want to be able to define your base composition and maybe even include a gene to deliver the gene as a scaffold of your DNA origami. Um, let's zoom out now and think of um, what options you would have should you be interested in single-stranded DNA or even buying single-stranded DNA or working with it. And of course, what comes to your mind or what comes to my mind first is chemical synthesis. And this is very good for oligonucleotides. Uh, chemical synthesis of DNA strands can easily be done until uh, a length of 400 bases. But simply the length you can um, produce in solid phase synthesis is not enough for a scaffold strand that would start at 500 bases. And we have DNA origami that assemble with 10,000 bases of a of, uh, long single strand. And therefore, there have been many excellent publications and tools around enzymatic approaches to produce long single-stranded DNA. And um, they all have 100% sequence freedom. So you can design the DNA strand that you would like to have. And actually, the Barter Lab has published a paper in 2017 that was with asymmetric PCR even able to go up to uh, 15,000 bases of custom single-stranded DNA. However, um, you might wonder if I tell you that most people working with uh, DNA origami still stick to M13 phage production. So a natural source of uh, single-stranded DNA from a bacteriophage. And um, the reason this started is that in 2006, when the first DNA origami paper was published, um, this single-stranded DNA, the M13 phage genome, was used for the first designs. Um, the reason why people still use M13 phage DNA is simply scalability. If you look into different enzymatic approaches, um, 
they all yield nanograms and maybe micrograms of DNA. But because most of them are PCR based and um, need heating and cooling processes that are very specific, it is hard and not cost efficiently able to scale them up to milligrams or grams amount. And that's why people stick to M13 phage production. And for all of you who have never heard of M13 phage or um, maybe you simply want need a quick reminder on how it, on how it works. So in bacteriophages are viruses that affect bacteria and the M13 bacteriophage has a circular single-stranded DNA genome that transfects this genome into a host cell and this one carries all genes needed for new capsid particles, replication genes, and also the packaging signal that defines the DNA that is then packaged and into new phage particles released into the solution without even killing the host cell. And from these phage particles, one can then purify single-stranded DNA. But when you look at the normal M13 phage processes, then there's a fixed reason, region of over 5,000 nucleotides coding phage, the phage genome that is needed for the production process. And this is why several research labs around the world have focused throughout the last years on the uh, biotechnological processes that would still use the M13 process, but then be able to reduce this fixed sequence region and produce custom DNA with it. And I have put here as a first a paper from 2006 from Justine et al. that doesn't even include DNA origami, but there people focused on phage display. Um, but they also, they in, introduced a helper plasmid into this phage production system. And this is the start where many people now, um, inc that this helper plasmid is what, something that many researchers have now included into their production process. Um, throughout the years, um, it was a, able to reduce the um, sequence fraction that is fixed in the DNA phage mid dramatically. And I wanted to focus in my talk more or less on the last two papers, especially um, because they really nicely add on to each other. One is from the Barter Lab. Um, and the other one was actually published in my last lab, so the DEETS lab um, last year. And I think it's uh, the one that got me hired from Mark at MIT. <laughs> um, both papers kind of focus around similar aims, but then again emphasize different steps in the process. So still we need milligrams to grams of DNA. We need and low endotoxin levels. And uh, we want to have sequence freedom to be able to produce synthetic sequences. Um, the solution here is still the M13 phage, but you have one, the helper plasmid that encodes all the phage genes, and then you have a phage mid that encodes your construct of interest. Both these plasmids are then transfected into your host cell, but the helper plasmid carries all the capsid genes, so the, the original fixed region and the replication genes, and then the phage mid only needs to carry the packaging signal, which is um, reducing the fixed region to below 300 nucleotides. Therefore, only this phage mid is packaged into new M13 particles, and then you can re um, purify your DNA out of that. In my publication, we focused more on DNA construct lengths and sequences, and we looked at different sequences between 1,000 and 10,000 bases and could get to yields of six milligrams per liter in shaker flasks. So I'm just uh, now assuming that at least some of you are familiar with gel electrophoresis, agarose gel electrophoresis. 
and can understand that here, this is a method to um, quantify your purity of DNA because it's separated by its size. Um, small DNA will run faster in the gel and large DNA will run slower. And what you can see here is that we could um, produce DNA in different lengths, um, but you can see also that the position where this DNA is loaded in the, the gel where you would normally expect aggregates is completely not visible. So I didn't cut off the pockets. It's simply not visible here because we have such a high purity of between 80 or 95%. The Barter Lab last year um, on the other side focused more on scalability and suitability for mouse studies. That means they didn't go for shaker flask, but rather for 10 liter bioreactors. And there they could monitor different time scales to see where the perfect optimized timing is to harvest their phage particles to get the highest amount of single-stranded DNA. They also included a separate purification step that allows them to reduce the endotoxin level that uh, is needed for mouse studies um, to go into mouse studies to 1.1 endotoxin units per milliliter. So that means that we now have a scalable process that yields milligrams per liter um, in 10 liter bioreactors. We have endotoxin levels that allows us to do mouse studies in this process. And we have the option to produce synthetic sequences of varying length and base composition. So you can say that in 5,000 nucleotides, you would only have 5% of a fixed sequence. Um, now, this is a question that I was puzzling my head around through the last days when I saw the registration numbers. Um, and I hope I can answer it by the end of the Q&A session. Um, so I know why I care about single-stranded DNA. The question is, why should you care about it? And I hope you're not only here because we put the word vaccine in the title of the presentation. Um, but even if you are, maybe you let me show you a few other research approaches that care about single-stranded DNA and long single-stranded DNA in particular. Um, Roth et al. Um, published a Nature paper in 2018 comparing single-stranded DNA to donors to double-stranded DNA donors in T-cell engineering. And they could show that they could reduce the off-target integration when they used single-stranded DNA to donors by 20-fold. That means uh, that, that single-stranded DNA might be even better for T-cell engineering. And um, this was followed up by a publication just from last year um, uh, from the Wolf's lab that uh, showed that when you then look into circular single-stranded DNA donors, they outperform compared to linear single-stranded DNA donors. And they used um, four different gene, genes in two uh, different cell lines, and this was the case for all different genes. Um, so that means single-stranded donor DNA um, has actually applic uh, applicability also in fields outside of DNA origami. And actually, they looked in the methods part of this publication, of course, because um, that's my what I do, and uh, saw that they even used PageMed DNA. But I must say that I, it seems that they struggled a lot in the beginning with the purification, especially because I think their study started before our publications were out. And um, that means that um, there's a need that we need to fill. And um, actually, if you're only here because you're interested in cost, I think that might be interesting for you. So after 2018, several companies, also Takara Bio, looked then into um, introducing long single-stranded DNA production kits into their product portfolio. And I did a quick cost calculation saying that should you want to 
order a production kit from Takara Bio to produce milligrams of DNA, it'll cost you $3,000 per milligram. On the other hand, using our biotechnological dose, you can reduce the cost per milligram single-stranded DNA by tenfold. However, should you be working in, with plasmid DNA, you still know that there is space for improvement and that plasmid DNA can be ordered in preclinical grade for about $2,070 per milligram. And I think um, we are on a good way to improve in that direction. So our future milestones are to reduce the endotoxin level by twofold. Um, we are already good enough um, to go into mouse studies, but we want to even get better to then be able to scale to 50, 100, and 200 liter industrial scale to then also keep a downstream process that lets us go into pharmaceutical grade DNA production. And then we are also thinking of producing linear synthetic single-stranded DNA, especially long uh, single-stranded DNA. And we have different approaches around that, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A session if someone is interested in it. Um, with that, that leaves me actually with my last question. I hope that this will be stuck in your head a few minutes at least after the webinar. And this is, if you had a technology that delivers or that produces milligrams of long single-stranded DNA, what would you do with it? And I think the past month has shown us that um, success comes when people start working together. And this is what we really want to do. And I can think I can speak for Mark and me that we believe in teamwork as a driver of innovation. And with this, I'm thanking you and I'm giving back to John in the main session. <laughs>